walking into the hall just now. It's as if you can feel stillness and hear silence. When we first came to this mountaintop eight days ago, we noticed the quiet outside. It's a very conducive environment. And for some people, at least in moments, the quiet on the inside now is uh, perhaps even more palpable. As the mind becomes more sensitive because of these moments of samadhi, many small moments as these retreats progress, some people still might feel that their minds aren't especially peaceful, but I'm telling you, if you were to suddenly find yourself in the middle of Georgetown, you would notice that your mind is very peaceful and still. Because there's an absence of coarse sense impingement, we don't notice. And as sensitivity increases, we notice our thoughts and our feelings more. So we're zooming in, and we see the stuff of the mind, and there still seems to be plenty of stuff in the mind. But for most people, it's much less. And this sense of awareness around the thoughts, around the emotions, around the feelings, is much greater. And this is why we can do these reflective meditations now and get some quite good results. The mind is malleable. We can train the wisdom, like uh, taking a razor and doing some delicate cutting out, cutting away of delusion, honing in on wisdom perceptions. One thing we have to be very careful of now is inevitably we'll grasp at whatever peacefulness there is because it's very peaceful, it's very pleasant. It's very important to try to maintain these spiritual powers in a balanced way. So if we grasp the tranquility and we want to hang on to the tranquility, then the sati, the mindfulness, that those conditions as conditions will get a little weaker. And then what you'll find is if something unpleasant occurs, you'll get irritated. And so now even though the mind is more sensitive and more peaceful, we have to be especially determined to know conditions as conditions. And as we're reading Ajahn Chah, we're saying not trying to control the conditions not contending, knowing their nature. The nature of conditions is unsatisfactory and a lot of sense impingement is unpleasant. Yesterday a few workers came up and they were going to dig a big trench in the middle of the centre here. And they're just fairly ordinary guys but just looking at their energy compared to the quiet, restrained energy of the yogis. And then you can see you're all currently enjoying a, a deva-like experience. It's deva-like because everyone is practicing circumspection and uh, restraint, mutual respect, mutual care, trying to do things quietly trying not to affect one another. And so, inevitably, we have to understand that this condition will also change. This morning, one yogi had to leave because his sister needed urgent surgery. So he rushed down the hill, gone to the hospital. And as I mentioned yesterday, a team of workers were going to come in and dig up big holes, make a lot of noise. So that is the realm we live in. 
there'll be illness, there'll be noise, there'll be pleasant but also unpleasant sense contact. And so today, even though the mind is going to settle probably more easily into tranquil states with the momentum that it has, we have to be determined to know conditions as conditions and not expect an unceasing experience of bliss or tranquility or peace. Even while we're experiencing tranquility or peace, we have to know that it will change. And the kind of peace Ajahn Chah is stressing that we cultivate is the peace of that which knows conditions as they change. We have to train the peace that we have to be the peace that knows all conditions in a resilient way, something that can roll with the punches. So we have some guests arriving a little later, and at first I thought I might discourage anyone from coming, but then I thought actually it's it's actually good if uh, five or six people come and sit with you towards the back of the room and just get a sense for change. And these, of course, very nice people who just allow, they'll probably be more restless than you and they might forget to turn off their phones. And just to be aware, this is a sign that the retreat will come to an end and that there's going to be all sorts of other impingements. When you go back to your families and your work in a couple of days, the practice that you'll have to depend on more and more is that which knows conditions as they are, worldly dhammas as worldly dhammas, pleasure is just pleasure, pain is just pain, praise is praise, criticism is criticism, and just this much, inevitable, and that which knows worldly dhammas, gain and loss, happiness, sadness. And so when the mind becomes happy, to try not to get lost in the happiness, because if you get lost in the happiness, you'll get lost in the sadness. So we're trying to cultivate a quality of peace which has equal components of mindfulness and wisdom. And we have to be able to patiently endure this is actually a beautiful word, endure patiently, beautiful phrase. And uh, spiritual practitioners learn a lot about enduring patiently. If the mindfulness and wisdom is good, and if there's a little bit of samadhi, enduring patiently isn't difficult. We just understand that's what one does with conditions. If the mindfulness gets weaker, and the wisdom gets weaker, you'll find yourself enduring bitterly. And bitterly enduring isn't peaceful. So just a few words about sharpening up the sati that doesn't just know feelings as arising and ceasing, but also knows the pleasant will change to the unpleasant. The refined will change to the coarse. In the conditioned realm there are heavens, because there are heavens there are hells. And because there's a daytime there's a night time. Because there's pleasure there's pain. Because there's praise there's criticism. And in the conditioned world it's full of opposites and duality. And Ajahn Chah is instructing us, keep the mind in the middle. So it's like a leaf, the mind's like a leaf, in the wind it blows, if there isn't a wind, it doesn't blow. And so we try not to let the mind be blown around by the worldly winds, we just know pleasure will change to be pain. There will be sadness, there will be sorrow, there will be loss, there will be sickness, there's even going to be death and training the part of the mind that can endure these things patiently, understanding their nature, 
it has to be like this, this is the way things are. And I'll say it again, I've said it several times, and I'll keep saying it, and I hope that some of you listen. No, not just that you listen, you're all listening. I hope that you really try to do it. Is that when you go back to your lives, you have to try to make them a bit more simple. Do less multitasking and less social networking. And then the morning practice, if you hope to be able to bring some of your mindfulness and clarity into your life, you have to generate it. And since it is actually the most important thing in life, it should be given the first priority. So it's the first thing we do. We get up, wash your face, go and sit, don't look at the phone, don't look at the computer, look at your mind and generate some clarity and then set the intention to take some of this clarity into the day. I think if you do this you'll find that you're able to hang on to some of the mindfulness and wisdom that you've been cultivating. Some of the practice that you've been doing is very high practice actually, very uh, serious, sincere, what they call gamatana. And you can see that when you have a momentum of generating the mindfulness and the metta, you sleep less, you talk less, that you can do these things and get quite remarkable results. You really see the parts of the body clearly and the sense of self can drop away to a significant degree. And the metta might become quite a bit more profound might have metta for many more beings than normal. And this is really wonderful because we see our potential and we see that our limitations are not real. Limitation can be expanded, developed. When in doing these practices, I'm also hoping that we're getting some imprints on a deep level that when we come to do serious practice again, we have this intuition about how to go about investigating the body in order to let go of delusion and how to go about really considering death in a very truthful and confronting way, confronting habitual grasping, confronting delusion. We do this to develop a quality of peace which is more dependable than the happiness that we can experience when dukkha isn't impinging on our life too much. When you go back to your lives, it probably won't be possible for most people to bring this same integrity of investigation. It'll be more necessary to try to let go of reactions. A large part of the practice will be letting go of reactions that are already there. And in retreat, we get to do the refined practice of not allowing the reaction. And of course, it's not the case that we'll be reacting all the time. If we have good mindfulness, we can see that we're about to react and we can stop. But sometimes, life has a way of being very challenging. Things will come up and a lot of practice will be reflecting on the reasons why you should let go of your reaction. It must be karma. Remember that the person is acting out of delusion. Forgive them. Those kind of things. And remembering that I act out of delusion. Forgive myself. That kind of reflection that we'll, we'll be doing. But this higher work that you've been doing has made some very deep impressions and it also accumulated a lot of good karma in wholeheartedly and sincerely doing the practices as you all have been. I'm very pleased and uh, gladdened by everyone's efforts.
to see people trying so hard and then also feeling the, the clarity in the air and seeing the radiance around people's faces. The sense that people have been working very hard. What we do when we do these kinds of retreats is when we wholeheartedly embrace Buddhist practices and the, the heartwood of the practices really investigating the nature of the body and the mind, not just trying to calm the mind a little, and really taking responsibility for the way we create suffering, acknowledging that we create it, and trying to take responsibility and telling yourself to stop creating it, let it go. But this is the real practice taking responsibility, learning what we do that creates suffering, and learning how to let it go. Lumpo Cha requires that we have this kind of candid truthfulness. When we do these practices, we're making a deep, auspicious connection with the teachings of Buddhas, and sowing the karmic causes to have more opportunities to practice and more opportunities to meet this quality of teaching. So that's another reason why I'm very happy that everybody has applied themselves so well. Is uh, If you take an opportunity that presents itself and you do it as sincerely as you can, you're creating the karmic causes to have similar opportunities. So that's really wonderful. Many religions teach sila and teach samatha and teach dana. Contemplating not self is rare. It's a special teaching and it's a teaching that the only teaching that really enables us to let go of the causes of suffering. So we're making deep auspicious connection with practices that will eventually uproot the cause of suffering. So that's really wonderful. In the last full day, we have to keep setting the intention, although in some respects, you'll have to watch the peacefulness crumble to some degree, and uh, the world will come crashing in on the emptiness. We have to be really determined to maintain some of that which knows conditions as conditions without contending. And a lot of practice in lay life, and a lot of practice even for the monks, is having to sit with a mind that is uninspiring. That same reaction that you know you shouldn't have and you wish you didn't have, but there it is. And we just have to sit with it. And Ajahn Chah says a large part of practice is knowing what you should let go of without being able to. But it's the sitting with it and knowing that you should be letting go of this. That's what conditions the capacity to be able to, eventually. It's not that we won't be able to let go of our reactions sometimes, we will. It's not that there will never be peaceful if we keep sitting, there will be peaceful sessions. But there will also be a lot of, why am I having this reaction? I want to put this down. Why am I thinking these thoughts? I know this is unskillful. Why am I still wanting these things? I've had these things so many times, they never made me satisfied. Why do I still want them? And we see the power of greed, the power of aversion, the power of delusion. We have to have a lot of patience. And you have to know how to encourage yourself. Keep practicing. Endure patiently. Understand that bearing with and knowing what is to be let go of conditions the capacity to let go of it. If you give up, and if you fall into denial, there's no spiritual practices there. It's going backwards. Let the practice go completely. Don't want to sit with the agitated, uninspiring mind. Then the things go backwards. If we can't go forwards, we try to dig the heels in 
and you don't go backwards. So just a few encouragements to hopefully help in the transition phase tomorrow. I don't want you to think too much about tomorrow, I just want you to enjoy the clarity and use it. Coming back to the aware of the in-breath, aware of the out-breath, noticing its change, resting in peaceful awareness, try to see the body as made up of parts and elements, not a self, not mine, not I. And at the same time, alternating sessions of metta, where we encourage and bless the conventional self, so that it has the energy, inspiration to continue the work of investigating not-self, this gradual training of developing insight and uprooting ignorance. I've said a couple of times, I'll say it again, I think everybody's practiced very well, tried very hard. I think most of you, probably all of you, have got some good results from your practice, so you can also rejoice in this and uh, begin setting the determination now that you'll continue with your efforts, hopefully first thing in the morning, every day. <laughs>